Hi, I'm Curtis Lassum, or C. Lassum on GitHub or Twitter. I'm a software developer for a university in BC. <clears throat> Not the one you're thinking of, the other one. So all of the slides for this uh, presentation live at curtis.lassum.net slash projects slash hashpres. Um, but uh, it's like 20 megabytes of images, so it, it's a big download. So hash functions taste great with anything. We are going to talk about hash functions. I know what you're thinking. Oh no, that's basic computing science. What does it have to do with the web? I'm here to learn about frameworks that are 15 minutes old, not math. When's lunch? And so on. But I'm going to do my best to show you why this fundamental technique belongs in your toolkit. You can tell from my drawing of a toolkit, I am not a handy man. We're going to talk about hash functions, hash tables, bloom filters, choosing hash functions for data structures, and hashes in security. You might be thinking, I already know what rainbow tables and bloom filters are for. I'm not going to learn anything. And you'd be right. So for you guys, I've hidden Portland Pete on one slide in this set. If you tell me where he was in the presentation after I'm done, you get a prize. But before you get too excited, the prize is a high five. Let's get started. What is a hash function? Here's an example. Let's write a function that takes a string, splits it into characters, converts every character into an integer, adds the integers together, and then mods the result by 100. This is a hash function. Not every hash function works this way, but this, like many other functions, is a hash. It has a number of useful properties. Regardless of what sequence of characters you put in, you're guaranteed that the output will be, be between 0 and 99. The output for a string will always be the same. Many different inputs can produce the same output. And given the output, it's impossible to guess the input that produced it. I know, I know. Involving the Wikipedia definition of something is the presentation equivalent to opening a speech with Webster's Dictionary defines. But it's a good definition. A hash function is any algorithm that maps data of arbitrary length to, to data of a fixed length. So no matter what sort of data you put in, you always get a variable within a certain range. So that's a hash function. Now let's talk about hash tables. Hash tables are a data structure concept used to store keys and values. Keys and values are important. You deal with them when you work with things like MongoDB or memcached or JavaScript objects. And if you're dealing with keys and values, chances are behind the scenes, something clever with hash tables is happening. It could be something else like a tree or a try, but they're not what we're talking about right now. So I'm going to pretend that they don't exist. So let's start with a big block of memory. Let's say an array with 100 elements. We want to store the value hash 215d29 against the key color. So we run a hash function on the key color. This produces a number, which we mod by the length of our table, which gives us an index. And then we can just store our value at the location pointed to by the index. That's a hash table. Easy peasy. A hash table is a data structure that uses the result of a hash function as the location to store the data in memory. This has a lot of really positive qualities. Insert is in constant time. Delete is in constant time. Lookup is in constant time. Search, don't, don't search a hash table, it's a bad idea. So this isn't actually quite so easy or quite so peasy as you might think. As the array fills up with values, it gets more and more likely that we'll have a hash value point to a spot in the array that's already full. This is called a collision. What do we do when there's already a value in the spot where we want to store a value? We can keep walking forward in the table until we find an available spot. This is called linear probing. Alternatively, we could route a linked list at every space in the array. That way, our hash table can take as many values as we can throw at it or a tree. We could also root a tree at every space in the table. This, rooting a separate data structure at every spot in the table, is called a chained hash table. Here, there's a bunch of different values stored where we're looking for the key cheese. How do we know which is the right one? We need to store the key with the value so that we can make sure we're retrieving the right thing. This is going to be the case anytime we have to deal with collision. If we can retrieve multiple values from our hash table, we need to be able to tell which is the correct value. 
even with some strategy for collision detection in place, it's possible for the table to get so full that it performs very sluggishly. A crowded chained hash is little better than a linked list. Or, in the case of hashing strategies that just shuffle addresses around, it's possible for the table to become completely full. When this happens, it's time to rebuild the hash. This is the time-consuming process of addressing an even bigger whack of memory, taking all of the keys out of the first array, rehashing them, and putting them in the second array. There's one language I can think of whose default hash table implementation can perform this computationally intensive rebuild step unexpectedly, any time an insert pushes the table above a predefined load limit. But for the sake of politeness, I'm not going to mention which language. Of course, linear probing and chained hashing are not the only hash table management strategies. There are many, many hashing strategies. Like Robinhood hashing, which steals data from your richer tables and inserts it into your poorer tables. Or hopscotch hashing, where you implement the entire array in chalk on the pavement. I am definitely right about those last two. No need to check them on the internet or, or anything. So the, TLD, the, sorry, the TLDR here is that hash tables are a fast key value data structure with constant time insert and lookup. Okay, so that first few minutes of the presentation was just there to get you up to speed on the basics. Now let's get to some of the meat, bloom filters. A bloom filter is a great way to keep balloons out of your face. Wait, I'm not sure how this slide ended up in here. A bloom filter is a data structure that's fast and space efficient used to test for membership in a set. That's important. It tests for set membership, but it doesn't store any data. It can tell you if something is in a set, but you can't retrieve an item from the set. Like if we have three objects, banana, apple, and bowling ball, and a bloom filter representing the set of fruit, we can use the set to determine that banana and apple are fruit and that bowling ball is not fruit but we can't give you a list of all of the fruit that were used to populate the set. We don't know them. We've discarded them. So, a lot of the time, bloom filters are used to answer questions like, is chumpies a real word? No. Is evil.ru a malicious website? Maybe. Is main.css in the cache? Yes. Or is this a banned image? Probably. Let's look at this image problem a little bit more. Let's imagine we're running a forum, and our itinerant users keep posting the same images again and again. There's gigabytes of the same few hundred images over and over and over. What we want to do is detect when the user is sending us a repeat image, and instead just use an image length that already exists to save on bandwidth and storage space. So let's say we run a hash function on the target image. Yes, you can hash images. You can hash just about anything. Mod the result by the length of an array move to that index location in the array, and then save a link to the image there. Then, when we're checking a new image, we can hash it and then check to see if it's in our array. Of course, this is just a bog-standard hash table, and I'm supposed to be talking about bloom filters. So this works fine, but it takes up a lot of space, and I promised you space efficiency. Let's imagine there are 5,000 images we want to keep out of our forums, and they take up 100 kilobytes each. That means about a 500 megabyte table of duplicate images. While it's not a ton of space, it's enough that you probably won't want to keep the whole thing in RAM. Remember though, we don't need storage from our data structure. We're only interested in whether or not the image exists. Let's imagine that we store zeros in every space in our table and we store ones where our hash functions land. That way, you can check if an image is banned by hashing it, modding it, and then checking to see if that spot in the array has a one in it. If there's no one there, we can't possibly have seen that image before. There's only one slight problem with this technique. What happens when we have a different image that accidentally collides with an image that we've set earlier? This creates a false positive, and unfairly takes pictures of Nicolas Cage out of circulation. How do we stop collisions, collisions like this from occurring? Well, we can use a hash function that guarantees an astronomically low probability of collision. MD5, for example, is a hash function that guarantees an astronomically low probability of collision. But, 
with the astronomically low probability of collision comes axiomatic pff, axiomatically an astronomically high number of potential outputs. With one bit for every output, you're suddenly saddled with 4 times 10 to the 25 terabytes, which is just a little unrealistic to implement as a bit array. It does hit on one of the two strategies we can use to reduce collisions, though. The obvious one, more space. Now let's look at the less obvious one. More hash functions. Instead of hashing our image just once, let's hash it twice with two different hash functions. This gives us two different locations in the table, and we can store a one at both of them. Another image might share the result of one of the hash functions, but it's not as likely to share the result of both of the hash functions. And if any of the hash functions point to a location with a zero in it, we know that this object can never have been entered into the bloom filter. So this is a bloom filter, a bit field, and multiple hash functions to set the bits in that field. We put items in by hashing them multiple times and setting the bits at all of those locations. And we check if items are in the set by hashing items multiple times and checking if the bits are ones in all of those locations. So there are some downsides to this bloom filter strategy. Because each item we put in the bloom filter has multiple hash functions, there can be some overlap, which means that we can never delete anything from the bloom filter. Here, for example, if we want to delete mods are asleep post ponies, it's going to clear the two hash functions that have been, uh, the two spaces in the array that have been set by its hash functions. And when we clear that, we run the risk of accidentally deleting something else that has overlapped with one of those two spaces, in this case, the Alan Turing picture. Now, there's a way around this called a counting bloom filter, where instead of storing a zero or a one at every space in the table, we store an integer that goes from zero to four, or zero to eight, or zero to 16. Um, this increases the amount of space required to store our bloom filter, but it allows us to have a certain amount of deletion because instead of overlapping, we could just increment the number again and again. Um, now this implementation has the problem of uh, integer overflow because we're using small integers in each space in the table. So there's a chance that we might have so many things overlapping on one point of the table that we end up overflowing that thing and accidentally deleting 10 or 12 uh, things at the same time, which is bad. So we've reduced the chance of collisions, but it's actually really impractical to reduce that chance to effectively zero. So there's always some chance of a false positive, which would, as we mentioned before, unfairly take pictures of Nicolas Cage out of circulation. However, this probability is at least a number that we have control over. If we know the desired probability of a collision, in the case of our image filter, let's say 0.1%, and the number of things we want to put in the filter, which, as we mentioned before, is about 5,000 images, we can use hand-wavy math to determine how much space we need and how many hash functions we need to get to an optimal solution. So, we need an array of 71,888 bits, which is about 8.8 .8 kilobytes. That's small enough that we could keep it in RAM. Heck, we could, we could send that bloom filter to the user and run it client-side. It's certainly a lot easier to work with than 500 em megabytes of stored image. We also need 10 different hash functions. A lot of the time, bloom filters are paired up with other data structures that handle the actual storage of the items. For example, they're really useful when paired up with data structures that exhibit worst case performance when searching for items that are not in the data structure. In a linked list or unsorted large array, for example, you get the worst possible case performance when you're searching for an item that just isn't there. The bloom filter can check before you hit the data structure if there's any data in the data structure for you to look at. Bloom filters are also very useful when the retrieval step for data takes a long time. For example, when a network call needs to be made to a faraway database. A local bloom filter is a wonderfully fast way to know if you are wasting everybody's time with a request for something that just doesn't exist. Or data with a very low hit rate. If you're dealing with the sort of data where you're getting 10 misses for every hit, you can catch all of those misses with a bloom filter. Google Chrome does this. When checking if a URL is malicious, it maintains a small, fast, local bloom filter seeded with malicious URLs. If the bloom filter flags a URL as a possible match, only then will Chrome make the milliseconds long round trip to their servers to check the details. This use case matches up pretty well with our list of times when a bloom filter is useful. 
A call to a remote server takes a huge amount of time compared to running a few hash functions. And maybe only one in a hundred websites you visit will actually be a hit. So in summary, and this is a big crowded summary, but in summary, Bloom filters are a fast, compressed, storage-free data structure used to check for set membership. It's implemented as a set of hash functions pointing to locations in a bit array. Items are set by repeatedly hashing the item you'd like to add to the filter and setting the bits at the hash locations to ones. Items are checked by repeatedly hashing the item and checking that the bits at all of those locations are ones. And it doesn't allow retrieval or removal. So now let's talk about how to pick which hash functions to choose when you're building a data structure. I mean, I showed you my awesome cheese hash function earlier, but it's terrible. And on top of that, it only really works on strings. Now, the number of different hash functions are countless, each one a unique snowflake. Only three of these are made up. If you're wondering, Pearson hash is real, but Lester B. Pearson hash is fake. Some 32 is real, some 41 is fake. And city hash is real, but country hash is fake. So, which hash functions do we pick for our data structures? Well, for data structures, the two properties we're looking for in a hash are that the hash should be fast and well distributed. When we say fast, what we mean is non-cryptographic. Cryptographic hashes are awesome. They have a bunch of properties that make them totally badass for security functionality. The most important one being that they're collision resistant. It's astronomically unlikely that you'll be able to find two different hashes that hash to the same value. But these cryptographic features also make them a lot more processor hungry. So we should avoid hashes like SHA or MD5 when we're working on data structure stuff because we don't need awesome security features in our Bloom filter. It's just a waste of CPU cycles. So when we say fast, what we mean is non-cryptographic and well distributed, which means that no matter how similar your data is going into the hash function, the output appears all over the spectrum. Here we have hell, hell and her, all very close in terms of the letters that are in them, but producing completely different output. And that's what we want from a hash function. Hash functions that exhibit this quality are known as avalanching hashes. Because small changes in the input lead to large changes in the output. Of course, this is also a desirable property in cryptographic hashes, but this one we're willing to blow our precious processor time on because it's really important for data structures that depend on hash functions to have well-distributed hash functions. I think I screwed up that last wording. Well, that's what you get. A common hash function used for this purpose is the non-cryptographic, well-avalanching, public domain Murmur 3, implementations of which exist for most modern languages and which has appeared in numerous open source products, including Hadoop, Cassandra, and Nginx. It also takes a seed value, so you can create dozens of different hash functions out of Murmur 3, just by changing the seed value. There are about five different implementations of it in NPM. One other thing, we hashed an image to put in our data structure. What sort of hash function works on an image? Well, most of them, really, but a perceptual hash, or p hash, is designed specifically to cluster very similar images together in the hash output. For example, if it's the same image but sized larger, or sized smaller, or skewed to the left, it should end up with a hash location very close to or identical to the hash location of the original image. Of course, by nature, this hash function won't be distributed in the way that we would need for an optimal general purpose data structure. It's the opposite of an avalanching hash. Small changes in the input lead to almost no changes in the output. But we can abuse that property so that false positives are unfairly clustered on images that look very similar to our band images, which would actually probably be a good thing. You can try it out with an npm install phash, if you'd like. Okay, so that concludes the data structures portion of the presentation. Now let's talk about how hash functions contribute to the security of your application. Okay, so you're running a web application, and the worst case scenario happens. Some hacker makes off with the user table from your database. How? I don't know. For the sake of argument, let's say SQL injection. At this point, your users are all shit out of luck, right? I mean, some brigand has made off with all of their passwords. Well, most of you in the crowd know. No, because our developers have cleverly obscured the passwords before saving them. 
Yeah, we're back here at the stuff that every software developer knows junction, but I think it's useful to establish a baseline before getting into the meatier details. So, in order to hide passwords this way, when the user creates a password, we don't save the password itself. Instead, we save the result of a hash function. Later, when the user tries to log in, they provide a password. We hash the password and compare it with our hashed password for that user. If the two match, the user has provided the correct password. Of course, if two different passwords ever collide, if two strings hashed the same output value, then it would be possible for someone to log in to our site with the wrong password. That would be bad. Do you remember earlier when I said that cryptographic hashes like MD5, for example, have a feature called collision resistance, which means that two inputs are astronomically unlikely to collide? Here is where that is super important. Now our passwords are protected. Yep, totally protected. Nothing could possibly go wrong. Rainbow tables, the way to break hashed passwords. So we've stolen a whole database full of usernames and hashed passwords, and we want to get at the raw passwords so that we can try them out on banking sites and stuff. What we can do is create a list of everything that we can think of as a possible password, an enormous, incredibly comprehensive list of just every possible password that we can come up with. Then, we use the same hash function that the programmer used to hash the original passwords, and we run that function on every single item in our gigantic password list. Now, we have a giant collection of hashed password pairs, which we can compare against the original data. Any time we find a match with one of the hashes in our set, we know what the password must have been. This checking of every hash in the set against every hash in the database is n-squared, but it's inherently very parallelizable. So with a bit of optimization, this can run very fast. This table of pre-computed password-to-hash pairs is called a rainbow table. The MD5 hash function is so common that Juso Salonen, I hope I pronounced his name right, released a utility called BozoCrack that works by taking a hashed password, searching for it on Google, and then MD5 hashing everything that comes back in the Google results until it finds a match. It's not quite as comprehensive as an actual MD5 rainbow table, but it still manages to be depressingly effective. Part of the reason the rainbow table attack is so effective is that because every user's password has been hashed with the same hash function, it's possible for us to test passwords against the entire table. While it's unlikely that we will ever crack all of the passwords, we're able to suss out the users who have simple passwords very quickly. Just testing the whole database against the thousand most common passwords shouldn't take more than an hour, and it'll provide us with a wealth of potentially useful data. So what we want to do is reduce the effectiveness of this kind of attack by using a different hash function for every single person in the database. That doesn't mean we need to enlist thousands of different actual hash implementations. What it actually means is that we want to use one hash function that we can seed with a different value for each user in the table before we hash the password for that user. It has to be a value that we have access to because we need to be able to recreate the custom hash function every time we check the user's password. It's quite common to use the username for this value. It doesn't mean you should use the username. Cryptographers recommend that you create a large block of randomized data and save it against the user to use as a seed for your hash function. This hash seeding value is called assault. So assault is random data used as additional input to a hash function to protect against rainbow table attacks. Once again, the Wikipedia definition. Okay, so that covers the very basics. And when I say basics, I mean the very most basics of security. This isn't exactly state of the art. Unix's crypt function first used salted hashes to protect against rainbow tables in 1976, a full decade before I was born. So don't use MD5. That's the next big topic in our security roundup. Let's talk about that. I've been using MD5 as my decrypto cryptographic, my de facto cryptographic hash, hash example for this presentation because it's well known and well understood and it's been in use for a good long time. Oh, that whole sentence just needs to be discarded. Well, we're going on anyways. 
Unfortunately, in the good long time that MD5 has been in use, cracks have begun to show in its venerable hashing algorithm. Coll collisions have been forced. It's growing less and less capable of standing up against modern hardware. The biggest reason to avoid MD5 is simply that it is too fast. It is possible to MD5 hash millions of values in a second. This makes brute force attacks against MD5 hashed passwords very, very easy. This MD5 hashing Python script I wrote runs, on a cheap little virtual machine, 1 million MD5 hashes in 1.5 seconds. Now, bcrypt is designed to be slow. Using the default settings on the same virtual machine, this run, which is exactly the same except for a different hash function, would take me 3.4 days. This, combined with assault for each individual user, means that brute forcing passwords out of a database could take days or months per user, rather than an hour or two for the whole thing. Bcrypt also comes with a work variable that you can crank up to make things even slower as hardware gets faster. When I turn it up to 15, my million hash script goes from 3.4 days to run to 26, 26 days to run. At this point, though, just logging a single user into my site could take a couple of seconds, and I'm not sure if they're willing to wait that long. So one of the rules, of, one of the key rules of security is just don't roll your own. Do not build your own security algorithms from scratch. Don't be clever. Don't try to implement a solution that seems like it should work. You must do the research on the problem space and use something that's designed with your problem in mind. So for password security, you should use something that's specifically designed for password security like bcrypt or pbkdf2. I don't have it on the slide right now, but there's also something called scrypt, which is very like bcrypt, but designed to work in a restricted memory space, which means that it's hard to brute force by increasing the amount of memory available to the algorithm, which is something that is a potential weakness in bcrypt. Uh, however, um, if you were to rank uh, how much security research or attention these three have received, it's pbkdf2 on top, and then bcrypt, and then scrypt at the bottom. So if you want something that's state-of-the-art, use scrypt. If you want something that is well-reviewed, use pbkdf2. And if you want something that's in the middle, give bcrypt a try. So even for general purposes, if you're looking for a secure hash algorithm, MD5 is kind of old and broken. SHA means secure hash algorithm and SHA-512, or 512, has become a new standard for hashing, one that's cryptographically much more secure. So that's basics and don't use MD5. Now let's talk about the next big topic, don't do client-side crypto. So listening to this, you might be thinking, why send the password to the server side at all? The user could just hash their own password and send the hashed password to the server for verification. Heck, we could go totally stateless. We could start including a hashed verification code with every instruction we send to the server. That way, nobody can tamper with our instructions to, uh, our instructions to the server. It makes total sense. Well, there are two different possibilities here. Either we're trying this from a browser, or we're not trying this from a browser. Let's look at the problem from the side of doing this from the browser. What are we trying to accomplish here? We don't want people who can inspect our traffic to be able to see the user's password. We don't want people who can inspect our traffic to be able to act on behalf of our users. So we send our users a bit of code that will allow them to obscure their credentials when they communicate with us. Except, if people can inspect our traffic, they can also alter our traffic, which means they can replace our crypto code with equivalent code that steals credentials. JavaScript browser crypto is exactly as secure as the transport layer providing it. So, JavaScript browser crypto over HTTP can't possibly be more secure than just using HTTP, which is not secure at all. And JavaScript browser crypto over HTTPS is exactly as secure as just using TLS, which is more or less secure. I trust that you can solve for the value of JavaScript browser crypto in this equation. Now, this doesn't mean that you can't do JavaScript browser crypto. If you're in a situation where, for example, your user is prepared to actually look over every piece of JavaScript that they've been sent by the server and make sure that it checks out, well, then you have very strange users. So let's, let's think about uh, not browser-based client-side crypto. We're, we're not doing this from the browser, but from a trusted library that we have total control over, and we still want to keep bad guys away from our user data and out of our application. 
Well, if we just send a token containing a hash of our password, all bad guys have to do to s is steal the token that we send with uh, the message and start running rainbow attacks on it. It's our password. Uh, plus, with our token, they can still pretend to be our user pretty effectively, which, which is bad. So what we need to do is maybe we could hash the password and a timestamp? Should the server keep track of the timestamp so it knows which timestamps it's received? Couldn't the attacker just steal our timestamp message and replace the command with their own malicious command? This gets really, really complicated and very fast, and it's super easy to do it wrong. We shouldn't be in the business of designing our own security algorithms. The hash function is a building block, but we need more guidance when it comes to difficult problems like this. Which brings me to my final section in this topic on security, HMAC. HMAC stands for Hash-Based Message Authentication Code, and it, it's sort of what we're trying to generate here. A cryptographic hash function can be used to generate a doc document signature, but some of the common cryptography hashes, like MD5 and SHA, for example, have a property where, once you have a signature for a secret plus message combination, it's trivially easy to generate secret plus message plus foo. So if you send the message yo, somebody else could steal that message and use it to send the message yo, take your wallet to the dark alley behind East Hastings at 11 p.m. tomorrow. Vancouver joke. Which would be bad. So, the thing about this is you can get around it by hashing message plus secret instead of secret plus message. But then, you're building your security algorithm based on properties of your hash algorithm. If a new hash algorithm comes around that has the same vulnerability but in reverse, you're once again boned. Using an HMAC protects against this kind of attack and a few other varieties of attack. It's a good way to generate a signature for a message. But it doesn't solve all of our problems. People can still snoop on our traffic. With no timestamp, people can still re replay our messages to the server with impunity. So the lesson here is actually that you also shouldn't be using HMAC for this problem. If what we want is encryption, what we need is a full-blown encryption algorithm like RSA, or a full-blown encryption protocol like GPG. The take-home message, though, is you, it's just that you really, really shouldn't try to build your own encryption protocol from scratch out of hash functions. It's like trying to build a car by yourself. You can probably do it, but the result probably won't be that safe unless you did a lot of research first. So that's hash functions, hash tables, bloom filters, choosing hash functions for data structures, and hashes in security. We've covered all the topics. So thanks for listening. That's my website. Way to go. End of the presentation.